everyone welcome to take charge of your health and to our last weekend of mental health month this is not the last mental health month though because we already are planning another month of mental health presentations in october i am your host sose stojkovic and i'm hosting from armenia as i mentioned before we would like to know as well where our viewers are joining from. So say hi, share your experiences and thoughts about mental health. And you're welcome to write your questions in the chat section on YouTube, as we will have a 30 minute Q&A segment after the presentation where our guest speaker will answer your mental health questions. Also look for any relevant health information about our ministry and our guest presenter in the description box. We have free handouts for those who have joined us today. And if you are watching the recording, please email us on takechargeofyourhealth101 at gmail.com to request today's handout. If this is your first time joining us, make sure you check out the previous mental health presentations as every presenter had uh, very valuable information to share with us so far. Also consider joining our online community by liking the videos, subscribing to our channel and sharing with your friends and family. Today's guest speaker is Jennifer Skews and she will speak today about depression, stress, anxiety, healthy emotional balance, EQ and IQ, among other aspects of mental health and uh, the background of these mental health issues. We will, of course, focus on the mind-body connection and link all this information and knowledge to the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. So a little bit about um, Jennifer Skews. Um, she works as a health psychologist and has been registered since 1993. She has a master's degree in behavioral health sciences with postgraduate studies focused on nutritional medicine for mental health. The focus of her work is on stress and trauma disorders, which covers an extensive range of mental and emotional health is issues such as stress, postnatal depression, PTSD, fear, anger, resentment, addictive behaviors, and gratitude and their impact on physical health and more. She has spent 16 years working in a psychiatric clinic on the Gold Coast and then started her private practice in 2009 and now working part-time. She has been actively involved in the Seventh-day Adventist Church since the early 80s and has embraced the health message. Her counseling and programs include a total focus on the client's needs, including physical, emotional and spiritual. Jennifer also uh, presents community programs. She has developed a safe trauma recovery program. Um, welcome to the program, Jennifer. Thank you so much for being here today. Pleasure to be here. So, um, yeah, we're very grateful that you accepted the invitation to share. Um, can you tell us more about the Safe Recovery Program and why it's called um, Safe Recovery Program? Yeah. Uh, the reason I developed the program is because many people were afraid to come for help because they didn't want to talk about their traumas. And this is something I've learned over the years. So what I decided to do was to let them know that there are safe ways of doing it. And one of the things that I tell people when they're interested is you do not have to talk about what happened to you that was traumatic because that actually can trigger the trauma and make it worse. It adds into the trauma. 
uh, multiplies it. So there was great relief from anyone who queried it because they tried other programs where they had to talk about it and it just made them worse, not better. So I teach a lot of schools, help them to learn that mind-body connection and how to reset the nervous system and the brain post-trauma and people can get well. It, uh, there are skills that work very, very well. And um, what I do is biblically based in what we understand as Christians and from what the Bible teaches us. So uh, that's sort of the premise for my programs. Very good, because um, we are taught in a way that in order to get rid of our trauma, we need to speak about it. We need to um, bring it up again. So it's um, from what you're saying is probably not the best um, thing to do in some instances at least. And when, when we've done the program, like we'll go through the slides I put together to talk about it, it will help people understand more about why we don't have to talk about it and what you can do to um, treat trauma or treat mm -hmm. stress. Mm. Very good. So um, we are excited to learn more. Um, let's start with a word of prayer and then we can get into the presentation. Okay. Um, dear Lord, thank you so much again for bringing us together for um, our last uh, weekend of Mental Health Month. Uh, we thank you very much for our presenters. And today we want to thank you uh, for Jennifer Skews that she's able to, to join us to share her knowledge about how we can treat um, stress, anxiety and other health issues. And we ask you to be with us today, speak through our speaker and be with us as we discuss and learn more about mental health and how to take charge of that aspect of our lives. We thank you and ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, the first slide you can see I've called this part of the program, getting off the emotional roller coaster, um, because most people that come to see me feel like they're on a roller coaster. So the question is, how can you get off of that roller coaster? And this is what the presentation's about. Um, emotions are God given, as we know. We were created as emotional beings. Wouldn't it be awful if we didn't have those feelings? Um, Galatians 5 22 to 23, which you'd be familiar with. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. So isn't it wonderful that God has given us um, such beautiful emotions that we can experience? And we are fearfully and wonderfully made. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'll just... Okay, so healthy emotions have a healing capacity and there's plenty of great verses in the Bible, but these two I've chosen from Proverbs and Proverbs 15, 13 says, a merry heart makes a cheerful countenance and countenance is the face, is how you present, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. So the Bible warns us not to be sorrowful, not to have those negative emotions um, and to be a cheerful happy person and to express it. And Proverbs 17, 22 says, a merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. Isn't that interesting? Because we know that um, osteoporosis is where the bones dry up and um, people often have a lot of mental health issues that help to develop these sorts of disorders. It's not purely physiological. And so if you've got a, uh, a merry heart, then it can prevent those sorts of things. Okay, this is from uh, Ministry of Healing. I've put my reference there. The relation that exists between the mind and the body is very intimate. When one is affected, the other sympathizes. So that's talking about the mind-body connection. The condition of the mind affects the health to a far greater degree than many realize. Courage, hope, faith, Sympathy and love promote health and prolong life. A contented mind, a cheerful spirit is health to the body and strength to the soul. And it's interesting because now science is telling us exactly this and it's, it's giving the effects of our moods and how we're feeling and what it does to the body and how we can use that to help treat um, illnesses. Hmm. 
this is a, a really good uh, little ex explanation, I think, that gives that mind-body connection. And I love peanuts. It's got some great things in it. And he says, this is my depressed stance. When you're depressed, it makes a lot of difference how you stand. The worst thing you can do is straighten up and hold your head high because then you'll start to feel better. So if you're going to get any joy out of being depressed, you've got to stand like this. And it's interesting because you will find that um, people who are depressed, if you watch, they look down, they don't look up, they hold their head down and they often slump their shoulders and you can tell by their tone of voice they're depressed when someone is really depressed. Um, and they have found physiologically in science that when you look down and you slump, it actually has a very negative effect on all the cells in your body um, and it starts to actually um, interfere with the right chemical balance negatively. Now, when you look up, they have found that when you look up, it actually improves your well-being and every cell of the body responds very positively and starts making the chemicals that you feel good. And one of the chemicals you might be familiar with are endorphins. They're our happy hormones. And so the way we walk, how we talk, our tone of voice, um, all of that and how the body presents affects the mood. Now, we're looking at another, um, it's an Ellen White source, manuscript releases, and she talks about material for facing life. And it says the word must enlighten the mind as to the true character of the emotions. So this is now the Bible enlightens the mind as to that as to the way we're feeling, for they are often changeable and very unreliable. I'm sure you'd all agree with that. And as long as feeling in no way takes the lines of control and interferes with the healthful life of the human agent um, in religious experience, there is no danger. The emotions are not always misleading, but as soon as they take control of the soul, body and spirit, they must be sensibly considered and restrained. Feelings are no guide. They are ever to be kept under the control of a firm, intelligent principle. In conformity to the divine will, the balance of the mind needs to be preserved. Um, and this is where I find people uh, often work on feelings. I feel sad, therefore life is miserable, which is the wrong conclusion, because you can feel sad, but life can still be good. So we must not use the feelings to colour the reality of what life is about or where we at. They are not a guide. In fact, often, and you've probably heard the term fickle feelings. Um, so the aim is, and that's what we're talking about today, is to be able to have those feelings, whether they be considered negative or positive, but um, allow our mind to still be able to work and function without being discoloured by it. Now, we're looking here at the cycle of emotion, and um, this is one of the handouts I've included, and it just gives you a bit of a timeline as to what happens emotionally. So when at this point here, we might have a, we can deny at the beginning of it and recognize or recognize the emotion. So some people might feel a certain way, but they don't want to feel it. So they pretend it's not happening or they deny it, they suppress it. So if you follow that line, the dotted line, it is the reaction. It keeps building. Then you suppress it. You sit on it. And I think emotional pain is a classic where we deny that you know, people say, oh, you're looking a bit sad. No, I'm fine. We do that sort of thing. Then we're reacting, suppressing it, locking it in. It escalates at that time or later on you get what's called an, the explode or the dump. And that explode can also include an implode. So if you explode, it can come out in anger. Um, we can berate people, do things like that, whereas if we implode we turn it in we're more likely to have depression and um, disconnect from life so then we've got an incomplete complete resolution and the pattern repeats itself so this is where trauma occurs when you have something stressful or traumatic this is what happens we don't know how to deal with it a child does not know how to deal with an emotion um, that, that's very negative but Part of the treatment I find is getting people to identify and recognise their emotions, except they're like that. Grief is a classic example. People uh, have lost 
a loved one or had a major loss and a few weeks later, I don't know why I'm feeling like this and I get them to accept it as part of the grieving process. Then they can release the energy and express it. And part of what I'll be showing you in this presentation is a very good, simple breathing um, process that helps to release that energy and express, express it. Then we can clarify it because the mind then understands it and we can then choose to act on it. So this is where I help people to do that pathway and then they can have a resolution and that's the healing process. So there's a lot that you can do, but it just gives you the two sides of the coin. So how can we define emotions? And this is from a group called HeartMath, and HeartMath have got several decades of researching the heart-brain connection, and I'll be showing you some more of that information and some um, diagrams that will be helpful. And they said the word emotion can be defined as energy in motion. Because how do you define an emotion? We say it's a feeling. But it's really because when you have a feeling, it's high energy. I don't know about you, but if I'm feeling great, I've got all this energy. If I'm feeling angry, it's not good energy. So it's energy in motion, what we do with it. An emotion is a strong feeling, a feeling such as joy, sorrow or anger that moves us. The experience of emotion makes life matter. It transforms our world from a series of events and facts into a living, breathing experience. And the bottom line is we will have good and bad feelings. They're not all going to be good ones. As much as I would like to live in that bubble, something happens, triggers things, and I have to deal with it. Um, so from a human's perspective, how can we understand our emotions and why do we um, develop as we grow up and we still don't deal well with emotions. So we've got two factors. You can see the iceberg, the IQ, which is the smaller part, but underneath an intelligent quotient is the EQ. So this is looking at what does that mean? Our intelligent quotient is a measure of our ability to use our intelligence, and that's using the mind to make um, good decisions to think logically, rationally, and it's genetically programmed. So it's something we are born with an IQ capacity. Now we can damage that, and this is where um, a lot of these children who are living on junk food are damaging the IQ because the brain's not getting fed and it can't manifest or live up to that IQ. So we can damage it, and I believe we can enhance it if we use the brain well. Um, we all have an IQ. And interestingly, some people with what we call maybe an average IQ, even lower IQ than average, uh, and that's determined by scores and that, actually cope better with life because they don't use their mind in such a complex way. The higher the IQ, the more we think and the more we try and make sense of things, which can become a problem. We can overload the brain. Now, the emotional quotient is a measure of our ability to use and have control over our emotions, and that is learned. So where do you learn about emotions? First of all, we learn from our family, certainly your mother, your connection with your mother, you learn a lot about emotions. She is meant to be your emotional regulator or whoever your primary caregiver is, because a baby doesn't has an emotional brain, but it can't think, it can't rationalise, therefore it needs help to do that. And also apparently about a month before we're born, um, we actually register in the brain, it starts to program mum's emotions. So depending on where your mother was at at the time, whether she was a happy person, anxious, depressed or whatever, your brain is already starting to program it. But don't despair because the good news is you can change anything. You can change any program that is in. Um, you just have to know what it is and how to change it. And that's what I do. I teach people how to change the brain. Now, there, I found five basic components of EQ. No, And this was from uh, Dr. Neil Nedley in one of his books that he did. And it's knowing your emotions. So we must be aware of them because some people I say, how are you feeling? I don't know, they say to me, because they're not in touch. So we then do things, to, I use faces or whatever, can you recognize how you're feeling? And then we identify them. Um, women identify their emotions more easily, I find, than males do at times. Managing your emotions. So how do I deal with them? If I'm feeling very sad, how do I deal or manage that? recognizing emotions in others. In other words, I can see someone and maybe have an idea of what they're feeling or how they're going. 
uh, managing your relationships. So if one uh, person isn't coping emotionally and the other is, that can cause a problem sometimes or it depends on where everyone's at with their feelings. But it, we can manage our relationships by our emotional quotient in reading people um, and motivation and setting um, positive goals is also important. So in being able to be motivated is very powerful because people say to me, oh, I don't do anything, I'm not motivated, I'm too depressed or whatever, but motivation comes with action. So when you, your emotional quotient and your emotions are balancing, you are motivated. It's a positive. Um, now, this is um, about our behaviours in relationship to having a healthy emotional quotient. And that means emotional quotient is your emotional balance, how well you balance your emotions. Um, so you have stronger persistence. You can hang and persist with things. You've got increased optimism. You're more optimistic, improved uh, problem solving. So the mind is clearer because you're managing emotions. So you can use your IQ more efficiently when you're managing your emotional balance. Heightened creativity and curiosity. And I find that when you are well balanced emotionally, you can be very creative in many, many ways. Um, and creativity isn't just about drawing or painting. It's how we use our mind. You know, a mathematician is very creative. Um, Greater cooperation, so that means because we're not overreacting all the time, we get on with people, we can cooperate. Intensified trustworthiness and dependability um, and continued commitment to learning and growth. So there are lots of positive from having emotional, that right emotional balance. So emotional intelligence is time oriented. And what I did, I developed um, a past, present and future model, which in, in the Bible, it talks a lot about the past, present and future and our time orientation. Um, so the question is, where is your emotional focus when you're in the present time? And the present time is made up of what you see on the left in the past, our past experiences, losses, failures, successes, disappointments, learned beliefs and values help to make up our present emotional state. Depending on your emotional state, it sets up future expectations of yourself and others as well as beliefs and values. So a lot of that is related to emotions. Now, here you can see we're going to look at the past because the question is, are you living in the present? So when you're in the present, how present are you? And I find when I'm not focusing well in the present, I'm often either dwelling on something that's happened, which is past, or looking at something that's going to happen. Therefore, I'm not picking up on concentrating in the present and I miss things. So if it's the past, the, the side of the brain, because we've got the frontal lobe of the brain here and we've got the left and right hemisphere, and it's that third of the brain that is your computer that focuses and is listening and processing. The left brain is more the rational thinking brain. And when you're in the present and you go over the past and you often go over the unresolved baggage, what happened to you? And it might be an event that occurred and you feel really sad about it, very depressed. You start thinking in terms of depression. Oh, life is miserable and I'll never get over it. And then we believe it, we program it in. And that is the left brain mainly focusing there. So um, we're self-focused when we drag up the um, emotional past. Now, when we focus, we're in the present, we start looking ahead then we're going left, uh, sorry, it should be, I've put in the wrong one there. It's a right brain focus. So I have to go in and alter that, make sure your handouts are right. It's a right brain focus and it's anxiety, fear, thinking and beliefs we have. So how often do you feel anxious in the present and you're projecting into the future? Maybe because of what happened in the past. Oh, I failed at that, therefore I'll never be able to do it again. I can't get a job, therefore I'll never get a job. And then we get anxious. So we're going for an interview, we get anxious because your last interview didn't work out. It's a bit of an example. Um, again, we are self-focused when we are projecting into the future. Um, and we've got the uh, that future fear thinking. It's called the what if the what if. if And what I get people to do in the present is to solve the past in the present uh, or solve the future in the present. So here you can see 
if you want to live in the present, where is your focus and what can you change? So in the present, if you are depressed, then you are using that gloom and doom thinking and believing life will never get better, for example. And that's because you've got a lot of unresolved emotional baggage, right? Your choices in the here and now is where we come to. What are you going to do with that? But if you don't know what that baggage is or you're not sure or you don't know all that it's connected to, you just stay depressed in the present. And this is where I help people then in the present look at what's happening and we don't have to go back to the past, but we can have a look in the present and work out what do you believe, what sort of thinking do you have, which is coming from the past and you solve it in the present. Then if you're in the present and you're feeling really anxious, you've got fear, thinking and beliefs, so it, I call it, like you hear, a worry wart syndrome. Um, we, we just stay in fear because we're always projecting. And I used to, um, I come from a family or a parent who was very anxious. I learned to be very anxious. So it was always the what will people think syndrome for me or I'll never finish it or, what you know, you'll find there are messages you have that keep that projection going and you can change that in the present. So I help people to identify, and that's what a lot of psychologists do. They help you to work out um, what's happening in the present and stop projecting it into the future. Um, now, the choice is in the here and now, so we can be solution-focused in the present, solve the problem. But if we're Christ-centred, because we know when we're centred with Christ, God's spirit renews your heart and mind. It helps to rewire the brain. Um, and particularly that left and right brain can be rewired into the present where you're not flipping back or flipping forward, okay? We need to be in the present. Where is God? He is constantly in the present. He knows the past. He knows the future, but he's not living there. He's living in the present moment. So if you want to walk with Christ, if you want to be with him, then you have to be in the present because once you get caught up in this reality or that reality, I believe, and what I understand biblically, is that God's spirit has to get the brain reconnected. And when we talk about the brain, you'll see why. Okay, this is learning to live in the present moment. And this is, I find some great, what I call gems that are very insightful. And this is a psychologist, a Dr. Richard Carlson. And you might have seen this little book and it's got some really good things in. Don't sweat the small stuff and it's all small stuff. And it's very practical. And what he's saying is we often get caught up in the little things. I think a good biblical example was Mary and Martha. Mary had the right thing. She was sitting with Jesus learning and Martha was fussing around the kitchen and worrying about the small stuff until Jesus spoke to her and pointed that out. And she was anxious and fearful at the time. So I often say to myself, am I being a Mary or a Martha when I get into those states, when I'm upset about something? Okay, so learning to live in the present. To a large degree, the measure of our peace of mind is determined by how much we're able to live in the present moment. Irrespective of what happened yesterday or last year and what may or may not happen tomorrow, the present moment is where you are always. To combat fear, the best strategy is to learn to bring your attention back to the present. Mark Twain said, I've been through some terrible things in my life, some of them which actually happened. And I find that's a good way to think because some things that we go through um, in life are going to happen again, but a lot of them won't. So practice keeping your attention on the here and now. Your efforts will pay off. How often have you worried about something and it doesn't happen? And then you're stressed about it. Um, and some people have the habit of going, well, if I, I fear it or worry about it, then when I get there, if it is that way, I won't be disappointed, which I don't think is a good attitude to have. It sets you up. So look to this day for it is life, the very life of life. For yesterday is already a dream and tomorrow is only a vision. But today well lived makes every yesterday a dream of happiness and every tomorrow a vision of hope. Now, isn't that what God would want? We have this hope. And this is even though it's the Indian Sanskrit, it's a lot of the spiritual teaching has some very wise things that we can learn from. So emotional balance, so the goal is balance, not emotional suppression. And this is um, um, from a book on emotional intelligence. 
And it says, every feeling has its value and significance. A life without passion would be a dull wasteland of neutrality, cut off and isolated from the richness of life itself. But what is wanted is appropriate emotional balance, feeling proportionate to the circumstances. And you can only do that in the present moment. When emotions are too muted, they create dullness and distance. When out of control, too extreme and persistent, they become pathological as if immobilizing depression, overwhelming anxiety, raging anger or agitation. So it's giving you some examples. So your feelings tell you when you are out of balance. So what's out of balance? Your feelings. But that means your brain's out of balance as well, that left-right brain function. Uh, and when we're emotionally charged, we're working too much with the right brain, anxiety, and the right brain is the window into the emotional storage area where we've harbored all the emotions from the past that we've not resolved, whereas the left brain is more the thinking and the memory banks there. Okay, so one of the principles I find really helpful, because it's good to have visual images, the brain works well if we have a visual, and the eye of the storm, again, I came across this from, this again, this Dr. Richard Carlson, the eye of the storm is that one specific spot in the centre of a twister, hurricane or tornado that is calm, almost isolated from the frenzy of activity. Everything around the centre is turbulent, but the centre remains peaceful. How nice it would be if we too could be calm and serene in the midst of chaos in the eye of the storm. Okay. Now, I, I have been online at times and had a look at, and they've had planes that fly into the eye of the storm. And it's like you're walled in on both sides by the clouds. And if it's a twister, then and they have taken photos or videos of the twister and you can see everything raging around you. Houses, bits of buildings, even animals are zooming around in that storm, but you're in the center. And apparently when you look up, you can see blue, blue sky as well as sunshine. Now, isn't that Christ? Yeah, you know, this is where I see it as a great analogy to look at Christ is the one that we need to focus on. And he keeps us in the eye of that storm. And it is so true. I find the only time I go into the storm is when I lose my present focus and let the, the emotion take over. And at Psalm 107.29, he maketh the storm a calm so that the waves thereof are still. And we've got many wonderful Bible verses that talk about the calm and the storm. And we know Jesus was in the boat and slept through the storm and they woke him up um, in panic, the um, disciples that were with him, and he calmed the storm. So in our lives, if we see the storm as the turmoil going on, and when you look around at the moment, look at all the COVID and the pandemics and sickness and wars, it's just, um, we've had the bushfires and floods, it just goes on forever. It's a storm out there, but we want to stay in the calm of that storm. And this is where maybe the eye of the storm visual might help you. So now emotions are to be controlled by reason and conscience. Okay, the power of the truth should be sufficient to sustain and console in every adversity. It is in enabling its possessor to triumph over affliction that the religion of Christ reveals its true value. It brings the appetites, the passions and the emotions under the control of reason and conscience and disciplines the thoughts to flow in a healthful channel. Now, if you look at that, it's if you want um, triumph over affliction, then Christ, of course, is our source. He will. He is the one that can help those appetites. And if you have a look at appetite, I often think of addictions. And I've had so many people, because I used to work with um, drug and alcohol addictions, and some of them would go to what they call the 12-step program with AA. And the first step is I have no uh, power over my problem, but there is a God of love. And when I hand over to that God of love, his power will sustain me. And I saw people coming back, no desire at all for their addiction. And they had to maintain that program to do it, but they couldn't believe the first time in their life they did not desire the alcohol. So that's how powerful that connection is. And we can use it every day. And that was from testimonies. 
Um, so how do you know when you're on the emotional roller coaster? Now, the Bible talks about the reason and conscience. Um, Ellen White talks about it as well from what she's learned biblically. So how do you know when you are on that roller coaster? So I put together, or it was actually my brother-in-law did it, and I've taken it and expanded it. And he talked about it and showed me the references. And it's reason and conscience um, has to be the top of the ladder. So this formula will help. So what is reason? Reason is your capacity to rationally think things through, to make sense of things, to make decisions. Um, it's that, well, this is where it's that left brain side that actually can reason things through in a logical way. And this is where if we're working in the world, it doesn't make sense. It's emotionally loaded. Whereas if we're working with Christ or with God, then we've got the reason. We can work with reason. Now, you add in conscience. Those two have to work together. Your conscience is your capacity to know right and wrong. And interestingly, scientifically, they've been able to measure the con conscience. And they found there is a part of the brain in the frontal lobe um, where it, um, when you make a decision, it lights up whether it's a right or wrong decision, and then we use our will or our willpower to then make, we choose what decision we want. Is it right? Is it wrong? And I'm sure you've had experiences where you, um, something happens and part of you goes, oh no, I shouldn't do that. A good example is you go to the shop and they give you too much change. You walk away and going, hang on, they've given me too much change. Now my conscience goes, give it back because we know that to me, it's stealing. So I'll go back and tell them they gave me too much change. And I usually get, no one ever does that. Wow, you're honest. Why are you so honest? And then you can talk to them about why you're so honest. But it's the conscience. It's that little part of you. And that's where the Holy Spirit has to work through the conscience. Now, if you shut the conscious, conscience down and you only have reason, this is where you get that more what we now call sociopath, psychopathic reasoning Without a conscience that tells me right and wrong, I can do wrong and I have no conscience. There's nothing that will tell me. And that's where I can commit a crime and I don't have a conscience that connects me with it's right or wrong. And, um, of course, in a, a court of law, then if there's no remorse, which comes through either conscience, then they get locked up and they will not release them again. So we, you need to have reason and conscience working together. So let's go to the bottom line. So now underneath reason and conscience, we've got passion, appetite, and emotions. Now they're all good. It's good to have passion. It's good to have an appetite for that passion. And it's good to have the emotions attached. So what is passion? It's actually a really intense emotion. So what are you passionate about? Like I'm um, passionate about mangoes. It's a very simple example because I love mangoes when they come into season. I've got a good appetite for them and I feel so good when I eat a mango that what do I do? Eat too many mangoes and then I've got too much sugar in the system. So you can see how I, instead of going, well, that was really good. I'll have another one tomorrow. I'll have too many. So you can see it's a simple example, but that's what happens. So the intense emotion, whether you've been creative, my work I'm passionate about, but if I'm not careful, I can become a workaholic, the appetite's too great, and then I do emotional burnout, which I have done before. So what's the appetite is how much that emotion is. It's, it's like when we desire a food. If we've got a big appetite, we're likely to eat a lot more, and it's the same with this. Now, I believe God has given us passion in life. You know, I know that I'm, he's given me passion to do the work I do. So if not, I wouldn't enjoy it. Um, so as you develop and grow, you increase the appetite and the emotional well-being that comes from a positive passion, particularly one that God has given you, is very rewarding. But if your passion is gone wrong and you've got the wrong type of passion or you're passionate about the wrong thing, like we talked about someone who with alcohol, then um, their passion is so great that they drink and drink and drink and emotionally they get depressed, they get miserable, they have a lot of grief um, and become very self-destructive. So you can see how it goes either way. But passion can be if anything that controls our life. If you have a look at people who sometimes artists who are passionate about music or about painting and what they do is they 
overindulge to the point that um, they've got excess emotion. So we've got reason and conscience, passion, appetite and emotions. We must keep that formula in a healthy balance. If not, we flip the equation. So I've abbreviated to reason over passion, which includes conscience, and that includes your appetite and your emotions, or passion takes over. Then you're on that roller coaster. So how do you know your passion takes over? So maybe that's something you can think about. When are you doing more than you need? And I appetite food and people say, oh, I know I had too much. It was so good. You know, I'm passionate about it. And uh, then they feel awful afterwards. That's a simple example. So what or who is in control? When do you know you're out of control? And these days we go, you'll determine that more. And how can you have stay or have control? So this is helping you to go and I go, hang on, I'm doing well today. And, I, you know, I was triggered here or I wanted excess air, but I said no because I knew it wouldn't be good for me or I'd be too tired. And I've stayed on that reason over passion side. But then if I flip it, and I want more and more, then I've gone the wrong way. So it's up to you to have a look at that and work it out. Okay, the true character of emotions. Um, th this is from Spirit of Prophecy. The word must enlighten the mind as a true character of the emotions. So this is where we need the word of God because as we read it, that, that first um, verse we looked at, which talks about our different emotions and what is appropriate. For they are often changeable. And in the Bible, it says, don't go to sleep or down to bed on your anger and very unreliable. So this is where we make decisions based on emotions. And the Bible's full of it. You have a look at someone like Peter who denied Christ. Fear was driving him. Must have been that day he denied Christ or those three times. So how, un how um, changeable and unreliable. Um, as long as feeling in no way takes alliance of control and interferes with the helpful life of the human agent in religious experience, that's in our Christian walk, there is no danger. The emotions are not always misleading, but as soon as they take control of the soul, body and spirit, they must be sensibly considered and restrained. So one of your questions is, how do I know when my emotion is too intense? Feelings are no guide. They are ever to be kept under the control of a firm, intelligent principle in conformity to the divine will. The balance of the mind needs to be preserved. So that's where I, you'll have the handout on the passion over reason model with a, a very good section that helps you to know, you know, what the mind, what the feelings, what life's like when we're on either side. It's a, it's a bit of a ready reckoner for you. Um, here's some quotes about our amazing brain because we're going to look more at the brain. The human brain is the most sophisticated, elegant, biological piece of machinery ever known and science does not understand it all. It says you don't have to be a neuroscientist to understand some basic brain science. And when we simplify it down like I do with people, you can understand even quite complex operations of the brain. Um, our brains are constantly in a state of flux. In other words, our brain is constantly working, moving, balancing. We, we, God has given us a system that wants to keep balancing. It's called homeostasis, and the brain is that. It, it, it moves around. Moment by moment, new neurons are developing and new circuits being laid down. Unused connections are removed, so our brain is sculpting constantly. Dormant nerve tracts are pruned back and unused neurons are deleted. It's a use it or lose it. So if you're on a pathway in the brain and you stop using it, then it starts to drop out. Incredibly, our beliefs, thoughts, behaviours and even our diets change our brain structure, ultimately changing who we are. OK, so people don't usually think what I eat makes a difference and it does. And one of the things I do is get people to work with nutrition, because when you're not well, you often your brain is starving. It's, it needs nutrients. OK, so our brain is actually a three part system, which is interesting. 
we've got the trio there. There are more parts than this, but these are main ones that have been identified scientifically. Um, it's a three brain system and we have to work. It's like driving a car. You have to have the accelerator, the brake, the gears, and that's what the brain is like. We are constantly working it. So we have a survival brain that's unconscious and that is the fight flight response. And that part of the brain doesn't think it doesn't, it just responds to the five senses. So when, when the body takes in a reaction to something, the survival brain will go into fight, flight to protect you. We've got to fight off the stress or flight from it. It works on autopilot and it keeps us alive. Now, if you didn't have a survival brain, you'd walk across a road not worrying about a car that's coming. Um, so it, it does. Our brain, I believe our brain's been created to survive and to live. When you look, it was after the fall that death came. So it still has that design, I believe, of wanting to survive. And this is what happens. Um, so if we can't fight or flight, like a, when we're in a, a trauma moment, when something is we're being yelled at or something traumatic's happening, we can't fight it and we can't flight it. That's when it locks in the trauma and the survival brain can then misread future events because it hasn't resolved that trauma. Now, the emotional brain is your second brain and that's subconscious, so it's a storehouse and it stores every emotion, every feeling in the five senses, sight, sound, touch, taste and smell. So the five senses can activate it. Um, it, it smell is takes more time the way it goes to the brain but stuff we taste and um, touch everything in any event it's five senses whether it be a good event or a bad event that's how it's it's, it's like a five sense around movie in your emotional brain it is the storehouse for um for fact or fiction truth or lies in other words it doesn't discern your emotional brain it believes and takes in everything it hears and sees it doesn't have that rational thinking it just stores everything and then sometimes that inbox can be too full um, the thinking brain um, is the conscious brain a gateway to storing memories in the five senses it acts as a gatekeeper to put in or retrieve information so your thinking brain is the conscious mind that can actually start to process the emotions the only way we can make sense of anything and go hang on my survival brain's kicked in how do we know and we'll work through this physiologically um, as well as emotionally they're the barometers but the thinking brain has to process it so we've got this constant working of the brain and this is a just a little overview it's a very basic one but it's showing first second third brain there basically but the first brain your and that's that survival brain, which is instinct reflex, um, is also housed in different parts of the brain. There's a little gland at the back and the top of the brain. So there are several areas that make up that first brain. Your emotional brain is the second one there, is the inner core. It's, the, it's one of the bigger parts of the brain where we store all those emotions. And there's a little part that stores emotions and also stores memories of visual events. Um, and they're the, what we call neuroplastic. They're the parts of the brain that can change and grow. And then, of course, your third brain is foresight, which is your thinking brain, and that's that front neocortex. So uh, I won't read through all that for the time constraints, but um, you will have um, what you will have on this is um, a handout with it on, and I've put extra information on all the handouts for you. Okay, so 1 Corinthians 2.16, for who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. So maybe that's something each day you can pray to have the mind of Christ and invite Christ in because his spirit will lead us and guide us and then we are covered by his cloak of righteousness. Our mind is protected. And in Ephesians 6, it talks about putting on the helmet of salvation to protect the mind. And Christ is the helmet. And what we put in our mind is so important um, that we uh, need to work with wisdom. And this has is, is been some really good research. This is a Dr. Andrew Newberg, a Christian and scientist. And he looks at faith in the brain. And he said, 
he reports that meditation improves memory and reduces stress and that the kind of God you worship can affect the structure of the brain. Now, meditation can, there are two, we know there's always two sides in this world and one is the right side and one is the wrong side so we're not talking about eastern meditation here we're talking about meditating on the word of god we're talking about prayer as a form of meditation being in nature and focusing on god so they find when they measure it it actually reduces stress if you have the right god in your life but if you have other gods that you worship that are idols then it has a negative effect and it says we've learned that being religious or spiritual has a very profound effect on who we are has a very profound effect on our biology and our brain so it it, it helps shape the brain it actually can change our brain and change ourself over times so this is why i they find that when you are really focused in prayer and meditation uh, as a christian that it has incredibly profound effects physically, mentally, spiritually, and every part of you. They've measured it. So this is, um, again, this is from that heart math research. It says positive emotions like appreciation, joy, and care are internal energy boosters. They create hormonal mixtures that nourish your cells and your mind. They have also been shown to prevent fatigue and slow down aging. They regenerate and sustain you mentally, emotionally, and physically. So don't you see that as having positive emotions are important? We can be feeling negative. Remember, feelings are fickle, but we can think positively. I can go, well, I didn't like that experience. What have I learned from it? How could I do it differently? Versus, oh, no, this is terrible and I feel so bad. So when you go to the negative, so what happens when you're stressed, you feel angry, anxious, worried or frustrated, those negative emotions change the hormonal mixtures into negative hormonal mixtures. High stress, so you've got adrenaline, cortisol and so many hundreds of stress hormones, keeps your system bathed in the stress hormones that can speed up your biological aging clock drain your emotional buoyancy and reduce physical vitality. And this is where you get mental, emotional health problems and, um, of course, physically you can do the burnout. Health benefits of positive thinking, isn't this wonderful? Increased lifespan, lower rates of depression, lower levels of distress, greater resistance to the common cold, but greater resistance to all viruses. It helps protect, it brings in, it helps the immune system better psychological and physical well-being, reduce um, risk of death from cardiovascular disease and better coping skills during hardships and times of stress. So you can work on positive thinking. We need to do that. Okay, the Lord would have our minds clear and sharp, able to see points in his word and surface, doing his will, depending upon his grace, bringing into his work a clear conscience, and a thankful mind. We want a mind that's clear. We need to give thanks every day. This kind of joy promotes the circulation of the blood. See, this is this mind-body connection. Vital energy is imparted to the mind through the brain. So um, the energy of the body goes through the mind and the brain. We can, if you're feeling flat one day and your energy's not good, have a look at what the brain's doing and what you're thinking. Brain, bone, muscle are to be brought into harmonious action that they all work well as well-regulated machines, each part acting in harmony, not one being overtaxed. So how many of you are burning out are finding that um, you're, not, you're going in the wrong direction? So what we're looking at today is how can you go in the right direction? And this is um, an early pioneer of emotions, a pioneering neuroscientist, Dr. Candace Pert. Emotions and their biological components establish a crucial link between the mind and the body. She has called these biochemicals molecules of emotion. We never thought of emotions as molecules. These information molecules carry a literal photocopy of the thought formulated in the depths of the memory networks of your brain. In effect, these networks create copies of your thought life along with the emotions that the chemicals coursing through your bloodstream literally um, carry around your whole body like an information highway. Good way to look at them. Information molecules are then able to cause changes at the cellular level 
actually restructuring the cells makeup on the outside and the DNA on the inside. This is how diseases are able to take hold in the body. So what you think and how you're feeling on a negative can be very, very destructive. And this is where they're finding these connections. Um, so diseases take hold with what we're thinking and feeling, and that's going around our system. So this is now looking at the model. And again, you're going to have um, this on a handout. So we're looking at these relationships. Now, the brain, even though we see the brain as the center of everything, and that's what a lot of psychologists do, the brain is the focus, but what is our brain connected to? And when we are connected to God, to Jesus, to the Holy Spirit, when we have that spiritual connection, the brain works through the conscience, that connects with the conscience. The conscience is clear and active, and that means the heart and the brain and everything can work well. That is when we go on that right side where there is the balance. Okay, so when you've got the balance, then you have a right relationship with God. When you're stressed out, it actually um, impacts that relationship with God. And it uh, the stress is not good. It, um, it, oh, it disconnects us really because it shuts the conscience down. And that's when we, and it's not that God goes anywhere. His grace abounds. He's there. We've we've got to go, we've got to tune back in. We've got to get our brain to tune back in to be able to do that. So then you've got the mind. The mind is programmed and learned core beliefs, and they feed our thoughts. So what I believe is what I think. So one of the things I said um, I was taught: what will the neighbours think? What will everyone think of you? The way you look, the way you act. So that that belief would colour what I'd wear for the day, where I'd go, who I would meet in a very negative way because it was a fear fear belief. And that then my thinking was fearful. Be, oh, maybe they didn't like me. Maybe they didn't speak to me because. So you can see how it drives that belief. But if it's a positive, then it works the other way. Um, so then you get the heart, that heart response. So you get a heart-brain response. So and remember the molecules of emotion so the the thinking and the brain and the heart now connects and that triggers feelings your feelings you cannot have a feeling without a thought if I ask you to feel sad or happy what do you have to do think sad or happy thoughts so then you've got that heart brain response again when you have a feeling you're getting feedback loops and then it goes to your physiology and your behaviors so you can change at any point. I can go, hang on, I'm feeling sad. I'll, I'll focus on something positive. So I then consciously take that feeling and look at it in a different way or get help to resolve it. And then I can feel good again because my brain has rethought it. Okay. Um, or I can be aware of my body. Think, oh, why am I lacking energy? And it's like, what am I feeling? I'm feeling flat. What am I thinking? Oh, I'm worrying about all those things I have to do. So then I can stop worrying, feel better or solve the problem. What am I going to do? Prioritise, uh, get help or whatever. And then you will find that that line from the mind to the feelings and to your body and actions and behaviours will be in a positive direction, not a negative one. Okay, so they're, they're feedback loops constantly. Uh, for some reason on that slide, the arrows haven't come out as I put them, but um, the, the picture, you know, if you get the handout, it will have the arrows connecting it all. Okay, so we need to guard our affections. Gird up the loins of your mind, says the apostle, then control your thoughts, not allowing them to have full scope. The thoughts may be guarded and controlled by your own determined efforts. Think right thoughts, and so that might be conscious. I'm not feeling good, but I'm going to think right, and you'll perform right action. So even though you're feeling a different way, you're feeling frustrated, but you can think clearly and you can act clearly. You have then to guard the affections, not letting them go out and fasten upon improper objects. So what we look at and what we do visually is important. Jesus has purchased you with his own life. You belong to him. Therefore, he is to be consulted in all things as to how the powers of your mind and the affections of your heart shall be employed. And isn't this what prayer is? It's that dialogue. It's that talking. And it doesn't mean you're on your knees all day doing that. I, you can talk to God anywhere, driving around the, down the road. I'll talk to Jesus or invite him in or ask him to tell me. And the spirit 
directs me very rapidly. The more you do it, the more that connection exists in the brain and the heart. Now, they, scientists are, can, can now map pathways that link emotion to health. The relationship between emotion and health is turning out to be more interesting and more important than most of us could have imagined. So we're looking at the lens of the 21st century science, anxiety, alienation, hopelessness. They're not just feelings. Neither are love, serenity and optimism. All are physiological states. So when you have a feeling, you don't think about your physiology and they affect our health just as clearly as obesity or physical fitness. Um, and the brain, as the source of such states, offers a potential gateway to countless other tissues and organs from the heart and the blood vessels to the gut and the immune system, okay? We can enhance immunity or um, negatively impact it and destroy it with the way we think um, and how the brain's programmed. The gut, the gut is called the second brain. And that's because it actually acts, it has a brain of its own in a way, so does the heart, but the gut actually makes a lot of the chemicals the brain needs. Um, so if it's not making enough serotonin, then the brain suffers, but the gut and the brain are highly connected and must both must be looked after. Now, one of the easiest ways of how feelings affect our body is in the effects they have on our heart rhythms. Okay, so when emotions are strong, they can be detected in those patterns or those changes of patterns in heart rhythms. And now there's this new research that's recently challenged several long-standing assumptions about emotions. For years, psychologists maintained emotions were purely mental expressions, and often we think that it's in the mind, generated by the brain alone. We now know it's not true. Emotions have as much to do with the heart and the rest of the body as they do with the brain. Emotions are produced by the brain and the body acting together. So you've got that brain, body and the chemicals happening that emotions are part of. And this is a good diagram and you have got information and you've got this on one of the handouts, how heart activity affects the way we feel. And it gives, this is giving you um, just the way on feelings. So if you have a look at the little picture at the face at the bottom, and you have a look at how those heart rhythms are going, and it's a sad, it's a down, sad looking face. Um, this the heart spiking, uneven, all over the place. And that's what is, you know, when they do those, um, monitor it on a computer then that's what they're seeing. But if you have a look at the smiley face, you can see the heart rhythms are more even and smooth, and that's what we want. When the heart rhythms are easy and smooth, then the feelings are positive. We're in the present, and your brain will be switched on. Both left and right brain will be working well because the heart will help the brain to work well. So, and they say it looks at the first, second, and third brain up there, but you can have a look at that um, with the handout or if you watch this presentation again. So you can see that there is a direct connection between all of them and it's to do with the five senses as well, picking up on those. Um, now the other organ or the other part of the body that's important in this, and I'll bring it together in a minute when we look at that breathing I was talking about, the autonomic nervous system, very important. Again, on the handout, I put extra information and you can see there's a sympathetic and a parasympathetic that make up the autonomic nervous system. It actually runs down the um, center of your, uh, from the heart down through to the lower abdomen area there. And you can see from the skeleton on the left, it's showing you the connections to the sympathetic um, and it shows you the connections in the top of the brain and the bottom down, right at the bottom part of the lower spine, it also connects to the parasympathetic. Your sympathetic is wired to the fight-flight mechanism. So when your survival brain says there's a threat, even if it's, it can be real or imagined, then you get all these things happening. This is where um, you can see from that list it speeds up the heart rate, it dilates the bronchioles, uh, you're secreting lots of adrenaline and cortisol. Um, it gets you ready, the body and the gut and the bowel ready to fight or flight. It's trying to, it actually gets the blood flow um, to the brain. The heart's now madly pumping, getting fl blood flow to the brain so it can think quickly and sending the adrenaline to the brain as well. Now, 
most people are living on the sympathetic nervous system. They're in a constant state of fight or flight. They're so used to stress. They go to bed. They don't sleep. We have massive insomnia problems due to this. Um, they can't calm down. They're agitated. They get restless legs. They get nervous, anxious. They do not enjoy life because they're not putting on the brake, which is parasympathetic. So if you see the sympathetic nervous system as the accelerator in a vehicle, and you're the vehicle and you're accelerating and you're not going anywhere, you're burning rubber and the parasympathetic brake isn't coming on. So you're going to burn out. But the parasympathetic brake is very powerful and things like being in nature, um, things like um, it, it, it's focusing on Christ, on God through beautiful I love the psalms the 23rd psalm is just beautiful and I've put that one to memory and certain bible verses and praying talking to God puts on the parasympathetic break there are things we can do from nature there's herbs there's different remedies um, things like lavender oil is a wonderful one putting it on the temples and the heart and the body if you like those smells. Um, Magnesium is another one that puts the break on and we'll talk a bit more about that as we go. But all of that will help you to um, put the break on. Okay. So this is the, the crucial one is the heart focused breathing, because when you correct the heart with all that research, they find it puts left and right brain back into balance. Now, there is a handout on this, but this is the simplicity so to do it, it's called heart rate variability, and that are those spiking uneven heartbeats to the um, even heartbeats. We want an even heart rate variability, and this will do it very rapidly. Focus on the area of the heart and breathe slowly and deeply, and just do that for about five seconds in, five seconds out. I find through the nose slowly, and then it's like blowing in a straw through the mouth to just get that bit of pressure. So counting to about five in, five out, and focusing on the heart. Even though you're not breathing with the heart, you're doing a, a deep breath into the diaphragm, the focus of the mind has to be on the heart. Um, and then you can, can reconnect the heart. If you had a good heart feeling, you know, I find there are certain things in nature or I've got two beautiful cats that, you know, people I love bring out that heart feeling. So it's not an emotion, it's actually the heart connecting. So those three principles, so putting your attention and putting your hand on your heart will bring attention and rubbing the heart really will help to um, calm it down. And they found even scientifically when you put your hand or your hands there, it calms the heart. So that is excellent. When we do that, all this works in um, synchrony. Lifestyle, mental, physical, spiritual health all works in. And you can see here you've got in the centre, you've got all the principles. Exercise, sunlight, fresh air, temperance, rest, water um, and a balanced diet connects the brain and all the organs of the body. So at the bottom there, you've got the heart. So when you have a good heart and it's beating evenly, and sitting in sunlight will do it, give you a sun bath. Um, you know, doing things, exercise will help the heart, even the heart out. So that sort of thing reconnects left and right brain and all of your organs benefit. Positive thinking will help that as well. Okay, so this is sort of like a final slide which brings it together and you, uh, a lot of people that uh, watching this might be familiar and I teach this to my clients who don't know anything about um, the Bible or God or anything and uh, say, why hasn't someone else taught me this? It's such a practical one. So we know we're familiar with nutrition and a huge bonus for all of this is magnesium. And I encourage people to take a supplement because we don't make magnesium. We have to get it externally and you can get it in um, an oil in uh, from the sea, uh, magnesium chloride oil, uh, it's best if you're doing it in a sort of in nature, have a look at the magnesium foods you can have because the soils are depleted. Stress diminishes magnesium rapidly. Um, and then we're then in what we call a drought. About 80% of people are in a magnesium drought in our countries, in Western countries. So, but nutrition is having a good balanced diet with fresh foods, uh, eating regular intervals. So there's lots of aspects you can look at there, but we're not. You know, I can't, don't have time to focus on it all. Exercise, 
I'm sure a lot of people know that. Even walking is one of the best, getting out there, fresh air, sunshine, being well hydrated. People often don't drink enough fluid, enough water. Herbal teas are good as well. And what happens, the brain actually shrinks if it's constantly dehydrated. And we need all the brain cells we can take. Sunshine. And if when you sit in the sunshine, it produces chemicals. Just to, And this is sitting in it, relaxing, not doing things as well. And it will bring about a state of relaxation because it stimulates chemicals under the skin, as well as, of course, giving us vitamin D. Moderation, temperance. Some things we need to abstain from, such as alcohol. But there are some things that are good that we can have and even healthy things we can be need to be temperate. If we love carrots, we can't eat carrots all the time. We need to have that temperance and moderation in things, a balance. Fresh air, get as much as you can. Rest and relaxation. Um, again, doing things that are restful, quiet things, being in nature is a classic one, going to the beach. I find even relaxing with a friend and having good conversation. And uh, there's always uh, music is another way of relaxing. And, of course, trusting in God. Um, that, uh, that should be on the top, but at least we finish with that one. And trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lead not on unto thy own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he, and I can't quite see the end of that slide, sorry, I've got a thing in the way, um, because God loves us when we trust him, absolutely loves us. So the last slide, the best remedy for those who are afraid, lonely or unhappy is to go outside somewhere where they can be quiet, alone with the heavens, nature and God because only then does one feel that all is as it should be and that God wishes to see people happy amidst the simple beauty of nature from Anne Frank isn't that and she was locked in an attic in the war for many years so it's a wonderful reminder and when you read that quote um, it because when you do if you Look at the heavens. Sometimes I just go out and I look up and just spend time looking at the stars and the heavens. There is no end. It's eternal. And that is what God is. It is an awesome experience, stargazing, um, nature, you know, being in God's creation. And it's so wonderful that we still have that. Um, things that we grow, things, forests and trees and going for walks. And it brings us so close to God. But it all of that helps to balance the brain and the heart and the body. It calms the heart, it calms the brain, we're back online. How often have you gone for that walk and been wound up and you come home and you're refreshed and the brain is focusing? So the aim is to get that brain balance because then we will be happy because God's presence will be with us. So I hope that this has been helpful. Um, and as it says in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your cares, worry and anxiety upon him, for he cares for you. And he does. He loves us. So to get off that emotional roller coaster, I've given you lots of information. Please request the handout. Some of them, and I've given an extra handout there as well on that, that um, brain body balance, emotional and brain balance, as well as several handouts on living in the present to give you a, a better view. But there's a lot more information on those handouts. So um, I encourage you to do that or to watch this again and take some notes for yourself. So thank you very much for watching this presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, such, yeah, such great information. I mean, I say this often, but it, it gives us hope, but it also makes us responsible to realize that at any age, uh, mm -hmm. the brain is pliable and um, flexible. And growing. Yes. Even the day we die, our brain can change and grow. It's not, we don't lose. They used to think we, our brain um, was made up of trillions of cells when we were born and we slowly lost them all over our life. It's not true. <laughs> yeah, that's so. what I thought as well. So, I mean, even alcohol, does that, when it kills brain cells, do they regenerate or that's it once killed? Um, um, well, once the, there's permanent damage, and I've even 
seen cases of young people who now have alcohol dementia, but they find when they stop drinking, the brain can do repair work. It's that balancing, it's that homeostasis. Um, God has given us a self-healing mechanism, but when we've damaged tissues and that to the point, sometimes they cannot be rewired. A good example is when you actually have a stroke and you lose, say, the speech centre. When you go to speech therapy, the brain already could do that function, even though the stroke destroyed the speech centre in the brain. But what's happened now, you'll find that the brain will repair and it actually rewires the speech centre when you go to speech therapy and work on the sound. So isn't that incredible? The brain can rewire its a new area. So that's encouraging. <laughs> yeah, exactly. As long as we've got our brain, we can, um, yeah, yeah. rewire we and... Do. We should be getting smarter as we get older. <laughs> we're going the wrong way if we're not. True. That's very true. Yeah. Um, so we had some um, good comments. One of them was an um, anonymous comment that said um, she's really good. I didn't realise how good she is. So that's, I'm yeah. glad I had years of experience and hard-earned experience at times. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, that's good. So it works. <laughs> yes, uh, exactly. Yeah. So we've got some comments before we get into our questions and answers. Um, so my husband says, absolutely incredible information presented in a great format and covers so much information that many of us can benefit if we put it in practice. Great job, Jennifer. God bless you and thank you. That was bless me. And I know I packed a lot into a short space, but I know we've got a question and answer tomorrow um, night, haven't we? We're doing, yeah, so we can expand on things and go back over things. But because the presentation is recorded, people can go and watch it again and explore it. Mm. Yes, exactly. So, and then um, another person says, positive thinking sometimes denies the existence of emotions. Having mm -hmm. positive mantras does not necessarily make for healing on its own. Do you have any comments on that? Positive thinking has to connect with, you know, that's that um, reason and conscience factor. It has to connect the whole system. So when you have a positive thought, there'll be an emotional response unless you shut down emotions, which some people have because of their history. So they think positively, but they don't have the corresponding feeling. But that's what we, we can work on, you know, when I help them with that. That's the extreme end. So having, what was it, having positive mantras and uh, there was a comment on that. Can you just, yeah, that. Um, oh, that's okay. Uh, there was something about the positive mantras I missed on that. That's all right. There it is. Um, it does not necessarily make healing on its own. We're a whole package. So if I have, like, thinking negatives and I'm putting in all the right food, it overrides the diet, you know, because it will cause a lot of stress and acids and that. So it's like the positive, like the mantras or the things we dwell on, also have to correspond with our lifestyle because if we're doing positives then we want to be positive in everything we do so it's a whole package that's how i see it mm -hmm. very good and obviously the person also says um really appreciate yeah. the eq focus <laughs> yeah Most of, yes a lot of them that don't have a very low <laughs> eq There's a lot of them around i think <laughs> and don't make good decisions <laughs> um a low eq we become very self-focused where if we've got a good eq where we've got that emotional balance then with self and others we're not mm -hmm. just in focused mm. yeah i've also heard that a lot of um a lot of ceos a lot of company leaders are actually sociopaths or psychopaths mm -hmm. um i yes. don't know if it's yeah <laughs> They, yes, um, and there is, there are degrees of the psychopath is totally emotionless. They will do the cruelest things, but you can have someone who's more the sociopath who they'll do mean things, but they still have an emotional content and they can feel bad about it afterwards. 
because really when you look at the psychopathic or sociopathic side it's all about self once we be, we all have the capacity to be like that but we're not that person but we'll have a moment where we're self-centered so that's purely what it is but when you worship yourself or you then shut down emotions and have no feelings for others, it, it becomes dangerous, as we know. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of that around at this time. That's what I find. Yeah, exactly. There's a, a big focus on self these days. Absolutely. Um, so I just wanted to I just wanted to share what um, you have I just your wanted to share. <laughs> Yeah, oh, yeah. shut them out. <laughs> yeah, we need a whole village to look after the kids. So <laughs> I'm reading a book. It's called "Can Attitude Affect Your Health?" by Danny Vieira. I don't know if you know about it, Jennifer, or not. No, um, no yeah. around. Good title. <laughs> yeah, and um, it is very interesting. I'm reading about it. So just very quickly. Um, she mentions, um, this is from a book in his own image, page 44, and it says that in some types of cancer can be a specific bitterness. Autoimmune diseases can be associated with self-hatred. And it says as we attack ourselves with our own words, um, thoughts or actions, we see a corresponding autoimmune response resulting in an autoimmune disease. Um, so that's interesting. She also says that certain emotions um, uh, target certain cells in the body that create certain diseases, and I find it really interesting. Yeah. We can um, turn on the genes if we've got a weakness in, as a gene pool. A good example of that would be um, um, diabetes. Yeah, there's a lot of that around. We can have a, a genetic predisposition but our attitude about what we eat and how we look after ourselves can determine whether you turn the gene pool on or not. And you can turn it off again. And this is where negative thinking or a negative attitude or a self-destructive attitude will trigger that gene and diabetes, you know, lifestyle, I put on weight, they won't care what they eat, they don't take uh, medical information into account, you know, that sort of thing, they have got a bad attitude about it, then it can affect every cell of the body. So, And same mm -hmm. with cancer. They're all autoimmune disorders, which is due to high inflammation that impacts the immune system. It's, it, everything goes wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. So in, in saying that, I know that um, I have the same type of, I had the same type of issues as my mum did when I was younger, mm -hmm. um, around the same age. I had the same health issues. And what I didn't realise is that it's not the fact that I was going to get them anyways. It was more the fact that we happened to have the same diet around the same time. <laughs> yeah. So it was to do with what you're putting in your body. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So okay. maybe I was prone to getting that health issue, which me and my mum got the exact same health issue. And even the doctor noted that. But yeah. what we didn't realise yeah. is that we followed the same diet, whereas now I got rid of it by following a different diet. Mm -hmm. So um, that is a very true. You took a positive approach. You thought, oh, I'll change my diet. So you took a positive step, which would have helped. Mm hmm and you more positive because you got good results yeah exactly and obviously that changes my attitude as well to know that i'm not stuck with that just because i'm maybe predisposed mm -hmm. um, to that health condition that's right mm. yeah so um one thing obviously that i was thinking about you were talking about emotions and um how we can maybe uh, so the thought that came to me was can we fake it till we make it according to <laughs> your presentation if we let's say if we walk you know upright that's, yeah. that's right if you do uh, that's a good example because if you're depressed and you look up and you change your stance for example it can make a big difference because it's going to stimulate some positive hormonal activity, right? Whereas when you, and the tone of voice, uh, and people 
can change their tone of voice because what you're doing, you're reversing some of the cellular factors into a positive from a negative by you working with the body, the body work. Okay. If you mm -hmm. want to feel, look down and walk around looking down and look at it's amazing when you, you know, I've tried it and it definitely mm -hmm. affects, <laughs> flattens, makes you feel a bit flat. <laughs> wow. That is amazing. And I remember Dr. Clark saying that even putting a pencil in your mouth in a way that you have to hold it horizontally like that uh, and you have to hold it that way even if you don't smile, that will change the chemical reaction in your brain and you will feel happy. When you smile, because when people are sad, depressed, angry, they scowl, they, their mouth goes down and they've done research It shows when even now if I put my mouth down, it affects the physiology, but it doesn't just, it, it starts to have a negative effect on the hormones and the cells and that by the way your mouth presents. And But it's not only me. If people see me like that, it can actually affect them as well. So mm. if I smile, even if I don't feel like it and I smile, that fake it till you make it, and I go, no, I'm going to smile, then um, because you and I'm not talking about the depths of biological depression, which we didn't what maybe we can talk a bit about tomorrow night because I didn't do that in this presentation, but the different types of depression because it's a big thing. But when you smile, you actually activate good hormones that can lift you up again. But when you look at someone smiling, the person might be feeling a bit down, someone's smile will lift them up again. The, your body, it's called a mirror image. We have mirror neurons, and they found that out with chimpanzees, that they mirror and they take on the other person. So when you smile then and it uplifts you, my mirror neurons will pick up on that when I'm looking at you and have a positive effect. Isn't that interesting? It's an, We have amazing, it just amazes me what God has given us, and we're so defective compared to what he first created. <laughs> It's a miracle that anything works at times. Yeah, that's true. Oh, oh, and dear. with that, I brought this example before that. With my kids, I found it to be true as well because I have to kind of entertain them. Even if I feel down, if I feel stressed mm -hmm. and depressed, I have to kind of entertain them and put on a smile and whatnot. And then I feel like as I do that, I feel happier and happier and I'm not faking anymore. <laughs> No, you're not. But it, it, it's the effort. Your, your your mind puts the effort in because the brain learns, oh, if I smile, I'm going to feel better. It knows it will stimulate some of those good chemicals in the cells. So we can change, yeah. constantly changing. So the more you smile, the more you lighten up and you enjoy life, um, then the, the whole system, your immune system's better, everything improves and you won't have illness factors like we see. But I, now I'm talking about someone who's doing well, but if you've got a backlog of trauma, you can't do that. You've got a lot more to deal with, which is why I see people and help them with trauma because um, I can tell them to smile. Well, it's not going to make a lot of difference because they've still got this whole programming in there that needs to be worked at, right, mm -hmm. and the body, you know, like with that breathing and that. So, um, but generally yeah. you're picking up doing that sort of thing is very positive it will really help yeah definitely and you even mentioned about putting the hand on the heart isn't that interesting that it, it seems to be like an automatic response that when we feel anxious or even scared the hand goes on the heart uh, yeah but at night when you go to bed just rub the heart and put your hand there and do a few of those breaths when you wake up in the morning do the same because it will, it'll, it'll balance the brain because often we can have a night cycle where we've had dreams or nightmares or things and we don't even remember them, but we often waking up is not easy, particularly if you're depressed or whatever. So doing that will really help to get the brain balance going and getting some, um, you know, oxygen back into the brain. So mm -hmm. it's... I think we do before, forget. Yeah, before you eat... You have a near miss in the car, do some of the breathing, calm it down. So it's something I encourage people to do daily, not just when they need it, to, to keep that brain balance works well. Yeah. 
that's yeah that's really good because sometimes we do forget to breathe it sounds funny but that's exactly how it is oh. so to finish off jennifer can i just uh, for those also for myself that um want to know exactly how to do the breathing exercises you said focus on one area on the heart do we have to look down or just in your oh, mind no. just you know like if you put your hand there you can feel your hand on that heart area so mm -hmm. when you do slow breath in you can feel it going through the heart into the, the lungs so you, and that's why mm -hmm. you use the hand if not you get used to it and you know you know you know that feeling and then when you're breathing out from the deeper part and what mm -hmm. happens when you breathe in, it opens everything up. When you breathe out, it does the release. It downloads. Mm -hmm. And what it does, it resets the autonomic nervous system, which is in um, the it's sympathetic in fight flight, and it's it resets the heart, the brain, and it stops the adrenals pumping when you do. And you only need two or three of those, or keep doing it till you've calmed. But eventually you'll find a couple of those breaths, if you've had a, a fight-flight response, will calm it down mm -hmm. really well. Mm. Maybe we'll talk more about the, the panic attack and uh, what works and the anxiety attack as well um, tomorrow when we have more time. Uh, but maybe to... Yeah, thank you. But um, maybe to finish off as well, um, can you just quickly tell us, you know how, based on what you said, it seems like our brain needs oxygen um, to relax. And then what do you think about, um, you know, when someone is anxious or stressed out, they get them to blow in the paper bag. Is that like an old thing that doesn't, um, you know, no one believes in anymore? or? <laughs> It does work, and that's where we're looking at the difference between panic and anxiety. Because panic, we too much oxygen, not enough carbon dioxide. Anxiety is a different breathing. So when the, when you breathe in and out the paper bag, you can breathe in the carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide is a natural ventilator and that keeps that opens the lungs. Because when you overload with oxygen, you get lightheaded, dizzy, and then mm -hmm. your lungs start to cramp over. So, and we can talk more about that tomorrow night and um, work with that a bit more if you like. Yeah, exactly. There is so much to learn and um, you've already given us so much good information. It's it's really good. Thank you so much and um, God bless you for, yeah, for sharing. If um, we can ask you to close with a word of prayer, that will be great. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonderful mind and brain and body you've given us. And we know that when we connect with you, that your Holy Spirit will help us to grow and that we um, will embrace Christ. And that means that our brain can be in balance. We have the right emotions and we can function at our optimum that you want us to do. So we pray that you'll be with each one of us, that you will help us to take in what we've learned this evening and apply it to our life to get the balance that you really want us to have emotionally, mentally, spiritually. We thank you and praise you and pray that you'll be with each one of us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much again. Um, God bless you. And we're looking forward to seeing you tomorrow, same time, Jennifer. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining and for participating. Um, can I just remind everyone that you can email us at um, techchargeofyourhealth101 at gmail.com to request a handout today that Jennifer Skews has prepared. I believe and I hope that we were all blessed by this presentation and all the wonderful information that we were given today. Um, join us tomorrow, 8 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time, again, to discuss more about mental health and unpack a little bit more of different aspects that um, Jennifer mentioned. And don't forget, if you would like your questions to remain um, anonymous and your name not to be mentioned, email us or um, send a private message and then we will address those questions to our speakers. Thank you again. May God bless you. And don't forget to share with those who will benefit with um, from these presentations. Thank you so much um, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye now.